This is Filmmaker Stories podcast brought to you by JB Audio Plus Production. My name is Janis Balodis and I have helped many filmmakers bring their films Sonic Vision to life. Besides that, I have always been curious to learn more who they really are. Being an independent filmmaker can be a lonely place at times, yet somehow everyone I meet is full of energy, life, passion and drive. In this series, I ask them to join the studio and tell us their very own unscripted story. Ivo Alexander is a Polish-German producer and one half of Tin Cowboys Productions. He has recently land produced the London unit of action movie Legacy of Lies and together with the other Tin Cowboy Carlos Bollinger produced their debut feature Clay's Redemption. I think people make films because people have always told stories everywhere, from the beginning really. If you read Christopher Vogler's writer's journey, then he relates it back to the campfire, where a group of people would sit around the campfire and remind themselves of who they are, where they came from, what journey they've been on. And I think we're still doing that today, though with a, with a slightly different type of campfire. I wrote a short film And as most uh, writers or actors do these days, I ended up producing it myself. And uh, in the course of that, I learned a lot and decided that actually filmmaking in and of itself is the thing that I want to do. And I discovered that I really enjoyed producing. I enjoyed planning putting everything together, putting everybody together, putting all these principles into practice. I didn't want to be a producer, or at least I didn't set out to be a producer. I wanted to be um, a writer, uh, a creative, and I kind of fell into producing. And uh, since then I've realized I'm not brave enough to be a writer or talented enough to be um, anything else, but um, producing seems to come fairly naturally, or at least uh, the tasks that it entails. My business partner and I run a media production company in London and our main focus of operations in this post-production basically making sure that the footage and the assets were given come out as the highest quality product and that we put together the best team we can for the job and on the other side we produce our own films because we got into this business for the same reason that everybody else did, which is to tell stories. My core skill set is line producing through uh, music videos, uh, short form projects, features, and by necessity, I've executive produced our um, first feature uh, last year, and this is um, out sometime this year. Our most recent project, Clay's Redemption, is a 77 minute fantasy urban noir which came about out of necessity and frustration largely necessity because we reverse engineered it instead of making it in the conventional way and frustration because we were attempting to make a project in the conventional way for the previous 18 months and found that the rest of the world or reality or our need to make the film happen wasn't going as fast as we wanted it to. So we found ourselves in a situation where we had all of the resources to make something interesting, just not what we wanted to at the time. So we decided to match the project to the resources. We had, uh, we had locations, we had actors, we had good equipment. So my friend and business partner, Carlos, grabbed the camera and said, hey, let's go, we're making a movie. And I said, okay, great, um, what, are we, what are we making? <laughs> so he started shooting a film based on this story which he'd been developing, and it began as a weekend project. We literally get all the actors out for the weekends to kind of uh, work with their, within their schedules, their existing schedules. And from there, it snowballed until we had enough material to make a trailer. And we used the trailer to raise funds for the rest of the feature. And by then, we had scripts, scenes, actors, props, production design, and all of that was coming into place. 
Clay's Redemption is also, I should mention, our debut feature as filmmakers and as a production company. And because of that, it's been an amazing crash course in filmmaking. I mean, we've made films before, just not on this type of scale as uh, pretty much every indie filmmaker who goes through this experience will tell you. And if we did that again, then we would probably do uh, most things differently. But even so, we're very pleased with the result. And I, for one, as a producer and as a filmmaker, I am always drawn to good-looking visuals, good camera work, good colors, good footage, good framing, and our film looks good. We have just finished post-production just before this whole situation kicked off. Post-production was literally the most challenging part of the process. Up until then, everything came together surprisingly smoothly. Post-production offered its own host of technical challenges, but we got there and now we're absolutely focused on distribution. Filmmaking and film production is definitely a different creature since I first uh, set out of being a producer primarily because of the global pandemic and people's attitudes both to production and to watching films, which are going to be completely different as we come out of this. I think cinema will become a more rare and precious commodity. And I think cinema ticket prices might go up in some cinemas, which will offer better service probably to a smaller clientele and uh, might go down in the multiplexes, which probably fight for the remaining businesses. As to whether it's successful, that remains to be seen. I genuinely hope it is because I've always been a huge fan of seeing it on the big screen. That's for me where it's at. In production terms, that's going to be very, very interesting to see. I think it's going to be a far more global picture than it has been. I mean, producers have started outsourcing to with a more affordable infrastructure, tax breaks. Uh, that's been going on for a good many years now. But I think they're going to be this idea of making a film in your, in your backyard, in your own country, in your local studio, that's going to be a thing of the past. I think people will definitely hunt for bargains, maybe go spend their resources on going further afield to optimize the efficiency. The two things that struck me the most in working in the film industry is what it means to be a writer and what it means to be an actor. Those two professions share one thing. If you want to be a writer or an actor, you need to be 100% dedicated to your craft. You need to have an endless reserve on, of optimism and energy and self-belief. And my respect for both actors and writers has gone up exponentially since I started working in film because I know that whatever else they may be doing, and they do a lot of other things in order to be able to be an actor or a writer, most of their brain is always focused on that one thing. In the case of being a writer, I've read quite a few books on honing that particular craft. And they all talk about how you need to put in the time. I've come across a few tweets, messages on social media recently during the pandemic about people saying, hey, I'm going to use the time to, um, to write a feature script, which I think is a great idea because it's, it's always good for people to exercise their gray cells. However, I also think that this is not something you just jump into. I mean, it's, it's happened. There have been people out there who have produced a script within a couple of months, and the idea has taken off and given rise to a film. But the uh, odds against that happening are astronomical because to be a writer, you need to... It's like going to the gym. You need to practice. You need to practice every morning, every day. Jack London used to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and uh, write between then and 9 a.m. And then that'll be him finished for the day. But you see, he would find that quiet hour every day to hone his craft. And just like actors, you know, go to the gym and make themselves look shiny or go to um, acting classes, go to their acting coach and hone their craft. Same with writers. The biggest challenge that you face 
when working on a project as an indie producer is to find your force multiplier. You, you look at the project and you look at what you have in terms of people, friends, equipment, access, and you think to yourself, okay, where can I use leverage to apply what I have to get the maximum possible result? Is it going to be in the production design? Is it going to be in the design of this particular character, whether it's uh, the actor's delivery or um, the visual style or the um, dramatic impact I'm going for? Or is it going to be one of those lean, stripped back projects, which is all about the interaction and the story and puts no emphasis whatsoever on delivery of it, much like a stage play. In other words, where do you focus your ideas and your resources? And being an indie producer, you, you definitely need to focus. You don't have the luxury of making the whole thing as shiny as it could be in your head. A lot of people get into this at a fairly early age as runners or production assistants, and I think this is probably the way to do it. I, on the other hand, jumped into it at roughly the age of 31, relatively late, and very, very green about what I was doing. Though I was lucky because I came under the mentorship of a director called Jane Foster, who came in to direct a short film that I'd written. But at the same time, she taught me all of the principles that she had learnt as an indie director herself. And uh, this proved absolutely invaluable. So for me, it was a learn it's been a learning process from the get-go, and it's still a learning process now. If I were to go back a few years and give my earlier self some advice, I would say take more time over casting because finding the right person for the job can make or break that particular character. And if that particular character is even a supporting character in your story and the audience doesn't buy that person on screen, then that kind of undermines the whole endeavor and ever so slightly torpedoes your other actors who have been perhaps well chosen and are doing their best. Perhaps the most common mistake is not planning your production around sound because without good sound you lose uh, roughly 50% of your production value in a flash and then you are into ADR, which is a technical and expensive process. So just like you want to know what your footage will look like, you also want to know what your location would sound like, because if you don't plan for sound of running water, nearby trains, traffic, overflying aircraft, even a, a construction site that has moved next to your set in the two weeks between when you planned this and now, things like that will cost you your actors' performances and then you're stuffed. So do your reconnaissance in terms of sound, in terms of sound, the UK both is and isn't a great place to make films. It is because of the um, huge amount of experienced as well as up-and-coming talent on offer. And the fact that you are always one or two people removed from the person you need to work with or you want to work with. It's a very closed, focused ecosystem. If you have the drive and if you, if you are mission focused, then it's a lot easier to put together the team that you need to, uh, to make your story happen. On the other hand, there isn't a system. If you work in Los Angeles, there is a system and a procedure for absolutely every single aspect of filmmaking. Here we have a small group of people who make very particular films in a few genres such as um, historical costume and social realist drama and then there's everybody else and every now and then the the, uh, the small group of people responsible for these uh, historical and costume dramas and whatnot go fishing and fish out an independent filmmaker and uh, say we're going to put our production muscle behind this the system we do have in place has a tendency to sabotage itself through bureaucracy and independent filmmakers exist outside a wall of bureaucracy. 
So every time they submit their project, it has to meet certain criteria. It has to say something specific about a specific community and involve specific type of people in order to be able to get through that bureaucratic filter. Now, if you have an indie filmmaker with a truly original idea, then in a sense, this bureaucratic screen filters out some of these original ideas which are just not able to get through and not able to get the, um, the support that they otherwise would have. So the system kind of works against itself. In my experience, the festival circuit is basically a marketing tool for the filmmaker, and as such, a filmmaker needs to uh, set aside what I call a war chest, a certain amount of money to go through the festival circuit. The festival circuit, on the one hand, is a good way to market your film, your independent film. It's essential to budget for that beforehand. Going to major festivals like, uh, like Cannes and Berlinale is almost essential because to go down this road you are going to need allies and uh, going to the film markets is probably the best place to look for them so i would advise any indie filmmaker out there to go on the road and to take their projects whether finished or whether in pre-production and go and and find those allies to do this, you need to allow for the element of chaos. You need to go out and create a situation where unforeseen but positive things happen to you and come your way. By introducing an element of chaos, I mean film festival, especially the major ones, they are a cocktail of actors, filmmakers, talent, plans, commerce. And the best thing a filmmaker can do is dive into all of that and see what happens and let their project find the thing it needs to find, for, for want of a better phrase. Sure, focus on the people you need to meet and you want to meet, but also additionally go with that mindset of finding that element of chaos, that element of randomness. Build randomness into your system. Distribution from the point of view of an indie filmmaker is a catch-22 situation because on the one hand, you want distribution to be in place even before you begin. But on the other hand, an indie filmmaker doesn't necessarily focus on this when making their first feature. Their priority is likely to be on getting their first movie right, on making sure the story works putting everything in place they need to film their film. Distribution is a minefield, and a lot of indie filmmakers step on a mine by accepting an offer from unscrupulous operators who are almost on the hunt for... who don't have enough experience, and they sign away their project to somebody who uses it to pay for their, um, for their sales expenses. And this is something that you read about and you hear about a lot. So on the one hand, you need to be very, very wary of that minefield as an indie filmmaker. On the other hand, you definitely should have a plan setting out. However, for an indie filmmaker, it's difficult enough making their first feature without having to worry about wandering into the minefield so the only thing I would recommend is to arm themselves with as much knowledge as possible and talk to other filmmakers who have been through that minefield. Because for us, this has been absolutely invaluable. Other filmmakers' experience navigating that minefield of distribution has been absolutely invaluable. I think for a good producer, you should, on the one hand, know what you're worth on the other hand, not be dazzled by uh, sales figures and really, really look closely at the contracts you're presented with and know what it's going to mean for your next step. That's probably the most important thing. So look gift horses in the mouth, read the small print and uh, tread very, 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 very carefully because there's an entire cottage industry which has grown out of feeding on independent filmmakers.
using what they produce to pad out their uh, their catalogs and uh, pay their salaries even. So be very, very careful and make sure you get good mentorship going down this road. Knowing what I know now, I would probably not do anything differently because, how can I put this, some things you just need to do. And if you have a certain amount of naivety about the difficulty of the process, then you tend to forge ahead with energy and optimism, which might otherwise transform into caution. And as an indie filmmaker, you need all the energy and optimism and drive you can have. So it's a strange equation because on the one hand, you want to know as much as possible about what you're getting into. On the other hand, thinking about it, probably knowing the the size of the mountain we would need to climb beforehand, the true size of the mountain, we might have uh, hesitated somewhere halfway up. But instead, we were in this psychological space of not looking down, not looking up, but just concentrating on the rock in front of you. Hopefully that allowed us to plan ahead enough to avoid some of the pitfalls that certain indie filmmakers come across, uh, get trapped in. I would say that VOD online streaming will play a larger part in how we consume film post this pandemic. But that has already happened, and it has been happening for uh, for a good number of years. I think what's going to change is the way we live and the way we work, the way we travel or the way we, we don't travel. So as our lives are going to be more focused around the place we live, then same with our entertainment habits. So I think people will watch more at home, and going to cinema might even become a rarity. However, I don't think the situation is necessarily going to impact independent filmmakers because on the one hand, the need for content will still be there, if not even more so. On the other hand, whatever it is we make, whether we make it for the uh, phone screen or some uh, VOD channel, we're always trying to shoot it in a way that's cinematic, that works on the big screen and therefore on all the other formats. Personally, I get a kick out of making things look and sound and feel as cinematic as possible. And I think most other indie filmmakers will always aim for that. Of course, it's probably going to be more difficult to find theatrical distribution from now on. But I think every filmmaker worth their salt is still going to be aiming for that one. If you have a good, workable and viable idea and a film or films behind you, then uh, that's where you want to be. At this stage, we are likely to go back to the project we were working on, which prompted us to make Clay's Redemption, which is called Welcome to Cobalt Life. And it's a 70s style conspiracy thriller, but set in an alternate now involving genetic engineering, femme fatales, um, ruthless corporations and all manner of shenanigans, stuff which we find quite fun. And this is a script that Carlos and I have been um, working on for quite some time. So now that we've made clay, we're going to um, focus on this one. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. The aim for the podcast is to provide a platform for first-time filmmakers to tell their stories, share their thoughts, knowledge and views, but most importantly, support and encourage others to follow their dreams. So please, like, share, rate and leave comments, but most importantly, subscribe so you don't have to miss the next episode. Until next time.